copy of the Word of God with you and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6 tonight. I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 6 was last week. Uh, I'm going backwards. Uh, I'm, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 1 tonight. That's what I meant. Isaiah chapter 1 tonight. We're going to have all these girls with us. Hopefully have a good time listening to the Bible as well in the back room. Really good singers as well. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1. Tonight's message is entitled, The Courtroom of Cleansing. The Courtroom of Cleansing. We're just, uh, we, looked, we looked a little bit of this passage last Sunday night, but I didn't feel I really covered it, so I thought I'd come back here again for another visit tonight. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. All sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your lands strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incenses, and abomination unto me. The new moons and sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek Judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. How is the faithful city become an harlot? It is full of judgment. It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Thy silver has become dross. Thy, mind, <coughs> thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the, whole, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will 
ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. We'll stop reading for there, right there, but uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the holiness of your word and also the holiness of yourself that we've already sung and talked about this evening already. Father, we pray that you help us to, to have the right perspective in life. Help us to not see just uh, what, what is on the outside, but help us to, to uh, allow ourselves to sit in the, in the seat in this courtroom, the seat uh, that, that is true and, and, and just, and the seat that uh, where no lies are spoken. And Father, help us to sit there and realize our need and also realize <coughs> the offer of cleansing that you're giving to us tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now here in the book of Isaiah, we, or Isaiah, whichever way you say it, we see the, the prophet who is known as the prophet of redemption. He's the prophet of redemption. Isaiah is like a mini, uh, it's like a mini synopsis of the Bible. It's 66 books broken into two sections, 39 chapters and 27 chapters, just like the Bible's broken up into 39 books and 27 books. And, but here we see such a complete picture in Isaiah, all the different subjects that the Bible covers, we see such a complete picture of God's uh, prophecy for the future. He was one; of, he gives one of the most complete pictures of the future, but he also gives one of the most complete pictures of uh, the message of the Bible as well. He's the prophet of redemption. He's saying that God, even though we're sinners, God will redeem us, and that's even what Isaiah's name means. Yahweh is salvation. He's the one who redeems. And so Isaiah, he was the, the man that God used at this particular time to focus Israel's attention back on God again. We said last week that the whole message of the Bible is the message about God. It's not about stories. It's not about different characters. It's the story of God. And it's the, the drama of God's redemption of His people is what the whole Bible's about. And so that's really what Isaiah is about. He was using his generation to to get the people's attention back on that once again. And he, he had such, a, he had such a, a unique opportunity. He, he worked there in the palace. His, uh, his father, it says, is Amos. We've looked at this maybe before a little bit, but Amos was, was the, uh, the brother of the father of King Uzziah. And so he was related to King Uzziah, the one who we looked at last week who had died. So he was related to King Uzziah. He was working in the, in the palace. He was, had a unique ministry to the people at the top there, trying to bring their attention back to God. And uh, we, we need people like that today. John the Baptist was using his day to try to point the King Herod back to God. And, and God's using people like that. And it's, it's good uh, to hear Jane praying for uh, David Cameron, asking us to pray for David Cameron tonight. The Bible says, uh, pray for kings and for all that are in authority uh, there in the book of uh, 2 Timothy, I think. But, uh, but uh, we're supposed to pray, we're supposed to, and he's drawing these people's attention back to them, but he does it in such a way, he says, even to the, the kings and the princes here in this chapter, he says, you need to come and, he says, even though you're the king, you're not the one in, in charge. God is in charge. God is on His throne, as we saw last week, and as we see in chapter 6. This is the vision that Isaiah saw. Uh, it says there in the, set, in the first verse, the vision of Isaiah. That's, the, that's really the title of this book, the vision of Isaiah. In chapter 6, he kind of goes back in time and says about how he, was, he saw the vision for the first time and how he had been commissioned to, to, make, this, uh, to make these sermons to the people. But uh, this, is, this is the beginning of the actual, uh, the words of the vision that he saw. But he, he asked these princes, he asked these people to come into this courtroom, and he says, I want you to reason. Come, let us reason together. As it says there in, in chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. You know, God's people, some people in the world, they accuse us, of not being reasonable people. They say, well, we're just escaping reality when we, when we become Christians. They say, we're just trying to use God as a crutch, you know, or something like that. But, uh, of course, I, we need, in our sinful state, we need somebody to lean upon. We need a crutch, don't we? But, uh, but he says here, come and let us reason together. Really, the truth of the matter is, Christians are the reasonable ones, 
They're the ones who, who don't hide from the truth. Amen. They're the ones who don't try to hide from, the, from their own sinfulness. Yeah. Other people try to live their lives as if something that was true wasn't really going to happen. They try to live their, their lives knowing that death is coming, and yet they try to put it out of their minds completely. They try to say, We're, we don't want to think about that. We're only going to live for now. But the Christian, the Christian faces the facts and says, no, there is a certainty of death. There is an eternity. We do have souls. And he faces all the facts. He faces even the fact that, that he's a sinner and that something needs to be done about his sin. The Christian is the one who has, who has reasoned with God. And so God says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. He says, don't just hide the facts in the closet, the, the, the fact of sin, the fact of morality, the fact of the law of God being written in your hearts. Don't just try to uh, uh, burn your conscience away from all those things. Don't try to hide the fact that nature itself even teaches us that there's a God. And our conscience teaches us that there's a God. and The Bible's there to t tell us the specifics about God. Don't try to hide from that, but let's reason together. Let's talk about your sins. Let's talk about your soul. Let's talk about all these things. Let's reason together. He says, come in and, uh, and face it. And uh, what, what a, an honest, the, the people who are honest are the ones who come in <coughs> to this courtroom of cleansing. But he asks in verse 2, he, he, uh, the first several verses, he gives the, the condemnation. It's like the prosecuting attorney comes in and gives the condemnation of the people. That's uh, verses 1 through 15 that we read. And he, uh, he, he gets the witness stand up. He gets the, uh, the jury, I guess, is up there on the side. And uh, who's the jury? It's the heavens and the earth. This is a cosmic courtroom here. And so he says in verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. So here's the Lord is going to speak. He is the one prosecuting here. And so he summarizes the, the whole book tells us, the whole book of Isaiah, he's, he's listing the things that they need to get right in their nation. But in chapter 1, he summarizes it all for them. He summarizes the sins of Judah. And Israel, here, he condemns how they have gone into ritualistic worship. And uh, they have gone into, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a vision from God, it's a revelation from the Lord. These false prophets are there. They're claiming to have visions in order to authenticate their prophecies. And, uh, but here we have a vision from God himself. He's speaking himself. And it's concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He's going to go on to talk about other nations in the book. But right here he's talking about them. And so uh, he, he gets the whole nation, the, the king, the kings, the court. They're all coming into God's courtroom. And uh, Isaiah... He was placed in this, these highest levels. So verse 2, he says here, I have nourished and brought up <coughs> children. He's nourished and brought up children. This is the first thing. He says, it's reasonable. Let's reason about this thing. Let's, let's look at it. I have nourished. I have brought up children. I've given them all of my care. I've given them all of, all of my provision. I've given them everything as a father for his children. I have nourished up these children. But these children, they have rebelled against me. They've rebelled against me, it says in, in the end of verse 2. So that's the, that is the uh, accusation. I brought up these children, but they have rebelled against me. Verse 3 says, uh, uh, The ox and the ass, they're, 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 they both represent these dumb beasts of burden. Uh, and they, but even they, he says, they're intelligent enough to know who their owner is. They're intelligent enough to know the source of their food. But Israel, they, they don't even know as much as these animals do. It says, uh, she did not know. Uh, it says, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. He says, you need to consider, you need to reason these things. Think about it. Think about all God has done for you. We need to think about all God's done. You know, the, the Bible tells us that uh, God treated Israel like his, his fig tree. And he gave them, in Isaiah, look over, if you will, at Isaiah chapter 5. 
Isaiah chapter 5. He says, I've nourished these people. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now, now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved. See, they, look at those words, beloved. His children, He's nourished them, He's brought them up. I, I sing of my beloved. God loves us. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. <clears throat> and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. <laughs> so now here in verse 3, he's saying, he's saying, let's switch it up a little bit. Instead of, instead of uh, Israel sitting in the, in, the, in the seat, in the witness stand, I'll sit in it. And you can judge me. He says, I'm God, but I'll sit here and you can judge me. He says, judge ye, O inhabitants of Jerusalem. I'll let you uh, see if you... Uh, let's reason about this. He says, what more... Oh, sorry, what could have been done more to my vineyard, verse 4, that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, uh, but there shall come briars and thorns. I will also command that the rain, the clouds, that they rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment and said, I want you to be able to judge things rightly. That's what he uses the word judgment there. But, in, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So he says, I'm righteous when I, when I say I've done everything I could for my vineyard. We can say the same thing, can't we? Uh, what more could God have done for us that he hasn't done for us? Well, the answer is nothing. God's done everything for us. The nation that we live in, of course, the, uh, but even closer to, uh, to home than that, He's given us everything we need as Christians to live the Christian life. And uh, even if we weren't living in such a, a blessed nation as England, He's done so much for us as Christians. He's, we can't say, oh God, if you just gave us a better book, we could do a better job. No, He's given us a perfect book with everything we need inside of it. We can't say, oh God, if, if we just had better... Uh, if we just had uh, more help, you know, we're so weak. Well, He's given us the Holy Spirit to strengthen Amen. us. He's given us the fruit of the Spirit inside of us. He's given us uh, a church to, to do things through. He's given us the plan in the New Testament. He's given us everything we need, all the tools, all the armor. We've got it all. And so he's, we can say the same thing. What more could God have done for us that He hasn't done for us? The answer is nothing. And so what does he look for in us? He looks for fruit. He looks for some fruit. I came to see if it would bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. He says, Israel, all I wanted from you is to is not, not just to soak up all the blessings for yourself, like this vineyard was doing. It was soaking up all the blessings, all the air, all the nutrients, all the sunshine, but it wasn't giving forth any grapes. It was just wild. It was living for itself. And the same thing with people. They soak up all God's blessings. God's put them in this earth. The, 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 the rain falls upon the evil and the good. We all soak up God's blessings by living on this earth. And, and uh, all the things, the goodness that He gives to us. And yet people live their lives for themselves. They live their lives in a wild way. They're just like a wild cult. As we've, we looked in the past at, at uh, the, that verse from Job. How man is like a wild cult. And his heart is uh, is is like a, a um, an untamed donkey, you know. But uh, when the Lord Jesus, when we come to the Lord Jesus, he was able to take a colt that had never been ridden on before, and uh, he was able to tame that when he rode it into Jerusalem. And so when we bring our wildness to Jesus Christ, he can use that. He can use us. He can use us for his glory. He's he he he's given us everything we need for cleansing and then to bear fruit for him. So back to Isaiah chapter 1. 
he says, uh, uh, I have nourished and brought up these children. What a, what, a, what a tender thing he's done for us. He's given us everything we need. And uh, the ox knows that. He, he, uh, uh, he's able to be tamed. He's able to be uh, broken. The wild mule. He says, why can't you? Why can't you let me tame you? Why can't you let me guide you? Why can't you let me use you in the same way? Uh, just consider these things, he says. And then, verse 4, he gives this seven, these seven distinct phrases of condemnation. He, he's, uh, remember, he's the prosecuting attorney here. He gives a seven-fold <coughs> list of what they have done. Look at the first word. The first word is awe, <coughs> sinful nation. That word awe there, it's uh, used when uh, Isaiah is lamenting something. Ah, oh, ah, oh, sinful nation. So he's lamenting. He's he's crying about it. He's he's not condemning them in in a in a hateful way. He's commenting them in a lamentable way. Ah, oh, sinful nation. Just like Jesus when he when he wept over Jerusalem. Ah, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Uh, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen doth your chicks, but ye would not. So the same type of lament here, and he gives these seven things. The first phrase says. Ah, sinful nation. So, the, the nation has turned to sin. That's the first thing he says. The second thing is, you, they, have, um, they are a people laden with iniquity. That's the second thing. They're laden with iniquity. That word laden means to be bent down, to be crooked with iniquity. You're bent down. You're almost just, it's almost the idea of being distorted uh, with iniquity. If you look over at, at chapter at, over in chapter 21 verse 3, Isaiah says, "I was bowed when I heard about this. I was um, I was dismayed when I saw it." And and so uh, he said, "Just me seeing how much how much these people are laden with iniquity, it made me bow with it, just with the sight of it and with the the sound of it, hearing about it." And you know, we look around us. Are we the same as Isaiah? When we look at our sinful nation, at the sin that's going around, it's just heaping up more and more and more in our nation. Are we bowed down with that? Is that a burden that we have? Some of these prophets, when they were prophesying, they, they, Isaiah's is called the vision of Isaiah. But Habakkuk, he says the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. It was a burden when he looked at these things. And are we bow down with it, but he says, you people, you are bowed down with iniquity, you are laden with it, and may you realize that this is a burden that God wants to free you of. And we looked at that this morning, how the Ten we looked at the Ten Commandments this morning, how they're not just a bunch of thou shalt nots, but they are, uh, uh, God frees us to be able to, to keep, to, to follow in God's ways. God frees us out of the bondage of sin, and frees us to be able to live and in God's way, and so uh, come. Let, let me let me uh, free you of this. The second, the third thing in verse four, he says, "You are a seed of evil doers. You're a seed of evil doers." That that word, he says, "You are my children, but uh, you're my offspring, but you are marked by wickedness. You're marked by wickedness. Evil doers there means somebody who causes evil." in a nation. You're not just living in an evil nation, you're causing evil <coughs> to happen. What a terrible thing when, uh, when a parent has a child and they raise the child in the best home possible, give them all the, all the, the love and support and the, the biblical training that they need, and yet they go off and they cause ruin with their lives and they wreck their lives and they, become, they, they don't just live in an evil world, they cause evil. And they, they actively, they, he's saying, that's what you've done. You were my children, and you have turned out like this. I've given you everything you need, and yet you are the offspring. Um, you are a seed of evil do, doers. Then, the fourth phrase, he says, you are children who cause the children that are corruptors. Children that are corruptors. So, they, they don't just cause evil, but they corrupt other things. You're, you're corrupting the nation, you're corrupting your family, you're corrupting your society. 
you've you've caused corruption. I you know God's God's given us. He has a great plan in life. He has this great way that it's, the things are supposed to be done, and yet the devil he corrupts things. And he says, you you all are children who have chosen Adam and Eve. They chose to go in with the knowledge of evil, and ever since then we've all been born into sin. And yet, if you're a Christian here today, God has brought you out of that. God has brought you out of that. Why would you become? Why would you go back to that corrupted way of life? The devil. He doesn't create anything. He just takes what God has made and he corrupts it. And uh, and that's what he that's what he does here. Don't live in a way that's corrupt. Then there's a fifth accusation. He brings. He says. Uh, uh, now these really these the, the fifth, sixth, and seventh ones in this verse are really the the key, uh, the root problems that Israel has. The fifth one is Judah hath forsaken. They have forsaken. The Lord. Judah's forsaken the Lord. And so that's really the, the main one. Judah has forsaken God and uh, the Lord that, that made them, that made them, that uh, brought them out of the land of Egypt, that brought them out of that. Uh, then it says, she hath, They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. That's the sixth. And the seventh is they have gone away. They are, they are gone away backward. Let's look at those two. They've forsaken the Lord. They, the, the, the word Lord there is Jehovah God, the personal name of God. They have God has given them His personal name. He brought them out of, out of Egypt. He said, I'm going to be known as Jehovah for you, Yahweh, the God. And all these, these great names that He's given, the God of, uh, uh, who provides, the God of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the, and uh, all the wonderful Jehovah names we've looked at in the past, that's, if you see the word LORD in all capital letters in your Bible, uh, that's always referring to the name Jehovah of God. And he says, I'm your personal, not Elohim, not just the God of the universe. I am your God, and yet you've forsaken me. And then, then he says, you've provoked the Holy One of Israel. Now this phrase, the Holy One of Israel, is one of Isaiah's favorite titles for God. It's mentioned twice in the Psalms, so he's quoting it from the Psalms, but he uses that phrase 25 times in the book of Isaiah. And that's really important. You know, God is a holy God. He has lots of attributes. And later on in the chapter, he's going to be called the Mighty One of Israel. But this first one, he says, the Holy One of Israel. And we looked last week at how around the throne, in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw God, what were the seraphims crying out? They were crying, holy, holy, holy. That's one of the key attributes of God. He's perfect. He's holy. And uh, that's what we're going to see. That's what uh, what Rudy, Brother Rudy read at the beginning of the service in the book of Revelation. Uh, how the, uh, They're in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. How the, the, the not just the seraphims are going to be crying it, but uh, the beasts that are there, which are probably the same things there in the book of Revelation, it's probably the same thing as the seraphims that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 and that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 1. They're there still in the book of Revelation, doing the same thing, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. So the Holy One of Israel, that's, uh, that's an important thing. Now when we see God's holiness, when we see God's holiness, what, what reaction did it make in Isaiah's life? As soon as he saw God's holiness and how, how mighty he was, that vision of God, he fell on his face. He says, woe is me. Here in the first chapter he's saying, woe is Israel. And he uses that phrase over and over uh, in chapters 2 through, through 5. Woe is, woe is Judah. Woe is Jerusalem. But when we see <coughs> Judah, they're, they should have this reaction. Woe, woe are we. For such a God, but Isaiah says, Woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. May we have that same reaction, realizing our sin. And then the last phrase that we saw, it says uh, in verse 4, They are gone away backward. And they, 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 what a terrible thing to turn our backs on such a God, deserting God for other gods. But that's what they've done. So all these things God says has happened, and so then he, he takes note of the judgment Isaiah does that's fallen upon, uh, upon Judah, 
and he asks in verse 5, he says, Why should ye be stricken any more? You, you will, but ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. He says, Why? Why, why don't you... Uh, he's asking this question here. Why will you continue with your rebellion? Why would you do that? It's a rhetorical question. He says, There's no need for it. He says, God's offering you this... He's brought you into this courtroom not to condemn you, but He's brought you into this courtroom to diagnose you and to give you the solution. He wants to fix this problem. He says, you're sick, your whole head's sick. He says, your whole heart is, is faint. And the, the head and the sick, they're referring to Judah's emotions. Their emotions are all over the place. They're, they're sick. They're not, their love isn't towards God. Their love is towards other things, towards idols. And he says, uh, you're not just sick, but you're from, your, uh, from the sole of your foot to your head, there's no soundness in it. Now I said to you this morning uh, that the Ten Commandments is like a full body x-ray and it goes right to the heart of things and it sees everything about us. Well here Isaiah he's doing another full body x-ray. He sees right into now the x-ray is not bad it, it's, it just tells you what's wrong. It tells you and, and uh, tell, it, it brings welcome news and so God's just He's just the doctor showing you the x-ray. Don't get mad at the doctor. Don't get mad at God for showing you your sin. And so uh, he says, the whole, From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And again, just as... The Ten Commandments that we saw this morning, they give the negatives. There is an opposite positive. And so he's saying these are all the negatives. They've not been mollified. They've not been bound up. They've not been, uh, they've not been closed or, or no ointment's been put in there. But he says, but I want to do that. I want to bind you up. I want to mollify you. I want to close all these wounds up. It, that picture there is a picture of a man with leprosy. And leprosy is a, is a, a picture in the Bible of sin. And uh, the Bible does say that uh, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That means the best we can do is as filthy rags. Those filthy rags that a person with leprosy wraps around their putrefying sores that has to be changed all the time. You know, I, we, we used to have a missionary come to our church in Tennessee named Tommy Tillman, a missionary to the lepers in Thailand. And he would come in and tell the stories of nobody else wanted to reach these people. Nobody else wanted to get anywhere near them. They still lived as outcasts. And yet he was the only one who would co go into their communities in Thailand, who would, who would give them hugs, who would help them. Who, and, but he said he started a little church for them. And uh, they always had to mop up every single Sunday because these people, their, their feet would just fall off their bodies and they would be leaving trails of blood everywhere during the services. And yet... That's a picture of, of what God does for us. These putrefying sores, they need to be bound up. Somebody needs to care for them. Somebody needs to help them. He says, that's what your sin is like. See it for what it really is. Don't try to cover it up with your hard skin and hard-heartedness. But let the x-ray come inside and see and diagnose it. So let me bind you up. Let me mollify you with oil. And that reminds me of... of uh, reminds me of... Um, the uh, the Good Samaritan, how in, in Luke chapter 10, the Good Samaritan says he, he went to him and he bound his wounds and he, he poured in the oil and the wine. And that's what God, Jesus Christ, he's like that Good Samaritan who comes to us. Everybody else might pass us by, but the Lord Jesus won't pass you by. If you cry out to him, he wants to come to you and bind your wounds and pour in that oil and wine. He says, let me mollify you with ointment. And then he goes on, he says, uh, your land is desolate, it's burned, uh, strangers are coming, they don't know all this is happening, but he says it's, it's as if it's already happened, this judgment that's coming, you're desolate, you're overthrown. He says, the daughter of Zion is like a, a, a cottage, verse 8, is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. This, this, this great city, Jerusalem, this fortified city, he says, really, you can't trust in all that. 
It, Jerusalem's just like a cottage in the middle of nowhere. In the middle, a little lodge in the Garden of Cucumbers. It's, it's all Jerusalem is when it comes to, uh, you have no shelter. You need, without me, without God being their, their fortress, he says, without me, you, you've left me, you've turned your back on me, and if, 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 if I don't have me, you're just like a lodge. Instead of a fortified, permanent city, you're this temporary, you, you've gone from the permanent to the temporary. And that's what so many people do in life. They, they leave God, the permanent, the eternal, and they look to the world, which is the temporary, the temporal, the thing that passes away. It's just a cottage or a lodge, just rude shelters that are placed up for the, the watchmen who guard the crops in the garden of cucumbers. And so he says, uh, to what he says here, except, verse 9, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom. We should have been as uh, likened to Gomorrah. He says, if it wasn't for my grace, the grace of the Lord of hosts, he says, uh, uh, except the Lord of hosts had left, he's the Lord of hosts. He's the one who has all the hosts of angels guarding us, protecting us. He has all these hosts. He's, the word Lord of hosts is the word Lord Sabaoth, which we sing about in the song. A mighty fortress is our God, uh, a bulwark never failing. Uh, he mentions, Martin Luther mentions, Lord Sabaoth his name. He's the one who protects us. He's our permanent fortress, and yet people leave him for, for the temporary cottages of this world. And he says, the Lord of hosts, look to him. He says, if it wasn't for him, then uh, if it wasn't for his grace preserving you, then you wouldn't be here at all. And uh, Paul, he quotes this verse in Romans chapter 9, Verse 29, and he called, he actually uses the word Lord Sabaoth. He's the one who's preserved the remnant even to this day, talking about Israel. And so Paul says, if it wasn't for his grace, Israel, they were such bad representatives of God's holiness in this world, he would have wiped them off the map. And uh, But he didn't. He, he's a God of grace. He's the Lord of hosts. He wants to fix things with them. And... Uh, we don't have time to look at all of chapter, uh, verses 10 through 15, but he goes on to talk about the, the how in, even spiritually they have the wrong attitude. Their, their ritualistic sacrifices are worthless. They're offering all these things, but they're not offering them with the right attitude. If you're doing all these things, sacrifices, they have, they're only about, <laughs> have only have any value if they're done with the right attitude. Jesus said, uh, They that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And so these people, they weren't doing it with the right attitude, with the right spirit. Uh, and so it's just ritual. You might say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, he's in, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, he says there's certain things that we do when we try to get right with God in our church. We don't do these sacrifices anymore, but we do have the Lord's Supper. And, uh, he, though, and, and in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, don't just do that out of ritual. And he, he talks about how when we do, when we, uh, we can eat and drink unworthily. So it's not just doing rituals. Some, some people go to churches where it's all ritual. They just go, they take the, the communion, they do all these things. They think they're getting favor with God, but God says all that's meaningless unless you've, your heart's been changed. All that's meaningless unless you've been forgiven. And so uh, he, he, he goes on, he goes into great detail about their vain oblations, and, and uh, he says, I cannot away with them, it's all iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Even when you come for the main three feasts, he says, when, when ye, verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread before my courts? They're all were required to appear before God three times a year at the feasts of the Passover, and the Feast of the Assemblies and, and uh, the Day of Atonement, the, the Feast of the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and at Pentecost. They're required to come, but he says, you're required to come, but why are you even coming? You're not even, uh, you're not even, uh, your heart's not right. He says, I cannot away with it. It's all iniquity. And uh, that means um, I can't even endure uh, that he rejects even those most special days devoted to worshiping God. He hates that ritualistic worship. and uh, But we have to note that Israel was a very religious people still, but they were very wicked at the same time. So just the act of worshiping is meaningless 
without the right heart and without God giving us His Holy Spirit to help us. Spirit and in truth. And God still hates ritualistic worship. But then He goes from the prosecuting uh, 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 um, listing of their sins, He goes to this invitation in verse number 16. He says, an invitation for you to come for cleansing. Wash you. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He says, you can't clean yourself up. You need me to cleanse you. Just the act of the ritualistic acts will never do it. So many people have tried that. The Romans even, they had, uh, they had this uh, saying, if you, if you flee vice, then that's the same as virtue. And they would, they would talk about that. There was lots of Roman philosophers who, who tried to do their best. So this guy named Seneca, he had all these great ideals for integrity, and yet he ended up assisting Nero in all of his murder plots, and he ended up killing himself, committing suicide. Uh, another guy, a German philosopher, he thought he had figured it all out, how to figure it. Uh, his name was Frederick Nischke, but he, uh, he says, Every, all, all man's problems can be solved by philosophy, and yet he ended up dying uh, of uh, dying in, of uh, a, a disease in the middle of uh, a sinful lifestyle and going crazy. And uh, so his problems couldn't be, be helped either. And Benjamin Franklin, he's, he's famous in America. When he was 20 years old, he made a list of 13 virtues and even wrote a book of virtues. And he says, every man can attain to these things. And yet, and you can look up online what those 13 virtues were, but uh, he made a little chart. But in his diary, he says, I have failed at all of these. All of my goals I have fallen short of. And... Uh, uh, Mr. Whitfield, the great evangelist, he tried to uh, get uh, Benjamin Franklin to come to Christ and come to him for forgiveness before he tried to get all these virtues in his life. But Benjamin Franklin rejected the gospel and uh, he died. As far as we know, he died in his sins. He, he, he probably was a better man for trying to do all those virtuous things, but he didn't find forgiveness and he couldn't live up to those standards that he gave himself. But what we need is we need God's cleansing. There was a teacher once. She was uh, she was in Eng it was an English class, and she was going through the different forms of, of uh, English tools, and she was asking them what a proverb was, and she was trying to give them an example. She says, "Cleanliness is next to what?" And the little boy said, "Impossible." <laughs> Cleanliness is next to impossible. Well, in our own righteousness, that is true. Cleanliness is. It is impossible in God's eyes. And when I was in college, I wasn't in the dorms. I got to live at home. But I remember every, every few months, they, all the people would be talking about the white glove inspections that were going to be in the dorms. And, and they would all be up late at night. Now, oh, I'm so tired. We were scrubbing the tiles with our toothbrushes and all this stuff. Trying to get ready for the white glove inspections, you know. But, uh, it, and, but of course, I did work at uh, as a... As a cleaner, all through Bible college, I would go to a school and I'd have to scrub floors and things. It's hard work to clean, and people work hard at cleaning themselves, but they can never reach the cleanliness of heaven. They can never reach the cleanliness of God, the holiness of God. We fall short of the glory of God. We can't clean ourselves. No matter how hard you try, you can never be good enough for heaven. God has to cleanse you. He says, let me cleanse you. Let me wash you clean. And you'll be whiter than snow," he says. "Let me let me do that for you. Uh, you know, uh, here he says, uh, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And he says, put off some things and then put on some things. Look at verse 17. He says, when I clean you, you'll get a new heart and you'll be able to live. Your life. If I do it, you'll be able to to live according to these virtues. If I clean you up, and then he says in verse 17, learn to do well. Seek to do judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. 
So that's the positive things. The negative things you know, found in verse 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. So in the Christian life, you can't just try to cease to do evil. You have to replace it with something else. You put something off and you put something else on. You take off your own rags. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. We take those off and we put on the righteousness of Christ. He clothes us in His righteousness. Our righteousness is not our own, it's Christ's. And so, uh, the same thing, same principle with the Christian life as well. When we consecrate our lives to God. Verse 16, we are separated from sin. Verse 17, we're separated to God. You don't just give things up. You replace them with the good things that God wants to get put into your life. Otherwise, there'll be a vacuum there. And, and Jesus said that. The man, he was cleaned of his devils. But then the, the devil got all of his other friends and he found him cleaned and swept and ready for, for even more. And so you can't just get rid of the old. You have to replace it with the Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. And so, separation unto. Be, the Bible says we're supposed to be separated unto the Lord. Not just separated from the world, but unto the Lord. And that's what uh, God said to the Thessalonians. You've, you, have, uh, you have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You didn't just give up your idols, you turned to God from the idols. And so that's really, really important that we remember that we need, to, we need to do that. The Lord offers this cleansing, but He says in verse 19, He says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. If ye be willing. Remember what Jesus said to Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together, but ye would not. Ye would not. They weren't willing and obedient, so they didn't eat the good of the land. And here again, Verse 20 says, but if ye refuse and rebel. So he gives them this invitation to come. And yet he says, but, uh, but they're just going to, to refuse. And they're, but if they refuse and rebel, he'll devour them with the sword. So that's the mark of real repentance. Repentance is not just turning away from sins, but it's turning to the Lord. And uh, then he'll help us with all those things. We, do you want to be clean tonight? Do you want to be washed? Do you want to be clean? Hopefully when you come into the presence of a holy God, you do. You want to be clean. And you realize, my own righteousnesses are not good enough. I need Jesus to clean me. I need Jesus to cleanse me. Come to that fountain that Jesus has opened and be washed of your sins. And the rest of the chapter, you can read it tonight at home, talks about how God wants them to be consecrated. The first one was the, uh, the first... Fifteen verses were the con was the condemnation. Then the next few verses that we just looked at was the cleansing. And then the rest of the chapter, you can look at it at home, that's the consecration. You can live a consecrated life. And Israel, they used to be consecrated. They used to be faithful and consecrated. But now they've become a harlot. He says, I want you to be consecrated again. So don't live your life back in the world. Don't live your life... Look at, the, look at those lists of sins in verse 4 again, those seven sins when you get home tonight, and say, Lord, help me not to be guilty of any of these things. Help me to be clean as a Christian. Help me to be washed. Help me to live according to your way and your, your word and your standard. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God tonight that uh, cuts us to the heart, that's, that's, that is like that x-ray vision that shows us our need. Help us not to rebel against that, but help us to sit down and be honest and, and, and look at nothing but the truth. Help us to be reasonable and reason with you about our lives. Help us to be honest about our shortcomings and our sins. Help us to allow you to help us with those things. Help everyone in our church to be reasonable people tonight, reasoning with you, getting things right, and uh, not, not trying to uh, hide any of these things in the darkness, but help them to all come to the light. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who's not Christian, may you're the light of your word. Help them, if, and that all of us who are Christians give us uh, hearts that are that are willing and obedient to come to you. In Jesus' name, we pray.